All right. Hello, hello. Welcome. Uh, first and foremost, excuse my allergies today. Um, I'm pretty congested, so I apologize if that comes through. But on to this week's lesson. So you have now a working knowledge of exposure. So you have your camera in manual mode. We talked a lot about exposure. So now you know how to adjust both shutter speed and aperture to get to what the camera says is your perfect exposure. Um, we know about equivalent exposure, meaning we can adjust different variables to get to that same equation and or we have the choice to overexpose or underexpose. So that is what you learned with bracketing. Why is that helpful? Because you don't always want to trust the camera. The camera might think that on a sunny day in the middle of the desert, they want it to be a mid-tone gray. You know, if that happens, maybe your whole image is overexposed, everything is just way too bright, maybe the camera just isn't picking up everything you want it. So in that scenario, you could intentionally underexpose and or give yourself just a few options of various exposure techniques so that you can choose, okay, what is giving me the best image overall at the end of the day? Is it what the camera says is correct or is it one of my manipulated photos? Alternatively, if you are taking a photo, um, one, one student actually took a photo of, it may have been a hallway, but it was mostly a white wall, and the camera will automatically want to make that mid-tone gray. So that person will want to overexpose so that we get back to that wall being a bright white rather than the camera trying to automatically make that gray. Okay, so there are so many points in your photographic career that you will want to intentionally over or under expose your photographs. That's great. That's awesome. Also, there are many times that you're just going to want to get yourself the most amount of options possible. Okay, and you can do that just by bracketing for yourself, giving yourself a number of options. I do that all the time. Um, another thing that I do that with is a subject of our lesson today. So that's gonna be focus and depth of field. Okay, so probably you have intuitively learned at this point that when you adjust exposure and aperture, something else happens. So what that does is it changes the depth of field. We call this depth of field. Often we kind of note a very masterful photo versus a mediocre photo based on that depth of field, that sensation that our subjects are sharp and in focus, things that are secondary information, often backgrounds, extraneous information is blurred. So that sense of depth of field is something you control in your camera so that you can delineate, okay, what is my subject? What's my focal point? What is the importance of this photo? What should people look at first? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And you can manipulate that with only the tools that you've learned thus far. So I'll go ahead and explain that further. Okay, so we have completed unit one. We have not completed all of those critiques, but we have completed unit one. Now we are on to unit two, which is focus and depth. So two very different things manipulated by the same control. So again, that focus is what is sharp, what is clear what is bright and beautiful and easy to see. Depth is that sensation that we are recreating that sense of space. So when we are taking photos and videos, we are taking what is happening in the real world, things that are very 3D, that are existing in this 3D world with light and shadow and mass. We are compressing that into a 2D plane. So by doing that, we are re removing this sense of tactile depth. So you can actually kind of recreate that or photograph intentionally to preserve that sense of depth, or you can photograph to intentionally remove that and make things very abstract. Okay. All right, so this chart ended up in a previous presentation, but I think it's helpful to show again here. So you know that these three items that we've discussed in length are the three things that you can manipulate to get the correct exposure. So that's aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. 
within aperture. So that was the point of our bracketing last time was adjusting the aperture. As you're working with that, you may have learned that when you adjust that, things become more or less clear or focused. Okay, so that is because of what your lens is actually doing. And I'm going back to the physics of the lens. So those of you who love math and physics, you're gonna love this. Um, for those of you who don't, you're gonna have to learn this via um, just hand and muscle memory exploration, but it does help to know the science behind what is happening. Okay, physics tells us that when light strikes a transparent medium, such as water or glass, it may bend or refract, right? So we know that, um, let's see, when you have a friend who's standing in a pool, say they're standing up to their legs, when you look at them from a distance, you might have this view that they are standing, and then once it gets to the water level, their legs look like they're bent and weird and funky and going in a whole different direction. That is because the, the light is refracting, so you seeing those legs through the water is actually you seeing that light reflect, refracting, so the legs look like they're going in a different direction. Okay, same things with a lens. The camera lens is designed to control this refraction and to obtain an image on a photosensitive surface behind it know this right and that is called a focal plane okay so we talked about this in camera obscura but I'll just give you a little refresher so you have all of these different light waves right so we know our visible light spectrum that was from the very first lecture that comes in through the lens and the lens actually bends all of that light into the central point then that actually gets flipped. So you, you heard the, the, the myth, I guess, the, the common legend that uh, our eyeballs actually see things upside down and our, our brain flips it sort of right side up. That is true. Anyone who did the camera obscura challenge knows that that image would be upside down. Okay, so all of this light is being condensed into this moment right here and then it's being spread back and recorded on either the film or the digital sensor, etc. Okay, so the amount and the degree of that refraction corresponds to what we call the focal length. Okay, you don't have to know what that is right now, but remember that term, focal length. The image should reach the focal plane at its narrowest point possible, called the focal point but that focal point changes depending on how far the object is from the lens. We must control the gathering of light rays on the focal plane to produce a sharp photograph. We call that mechanism focus. Okay, so all of those kind of big confusing jumble of words means that you need to adjust where your lens is in space, you need to adjust where your object is standing, sitting, lying, whatever, from that lens, and then you can adjust the amount and the distance of that refracting focal plane. You can change that focal distance, right, so that your subject becomes either blurry or sharp. So that focal plane, imagine um, that you're holding a piece of glass so it's you with a, with a camera, and then someone else has a piece of glass that is between you, like a window between you and your subject. They could roll that piece of glass forward or backward based on your lens. So you can change the focal point of your lens, and it's as if that person is wheeling that pane of glass forward or backward. And imagine everything within that pane of glass is in focus, everything around it is blurry. So that's, that's the way that I think about the focal plane. It is like a physical 2D plane that exists somewhere in space. So if I'm taking a portrait of a person, I want to roll that window right to probably their, their eyes, and that I want to be in my focal plane. Everything else can be blurry, but I want that 
that focal plane to be very clear, and very bright, very obvious. Okay, so that is adjusting the focal length and the focal point to decide the focal plane. All right, to focus an image onto the sensor, we move actual elements in the lens forward or backward. Okay, so go ahead and grab your camera and just twist that focal lens. Okay, so as you twist your lens, that is adapting our focal distance, either longer or shorter. Okay, for this next round, if you have an autofocus, flip it to manual focus. We are not using autofocus auto for this next project. Okay, so sw swap it to autofocus, change that focal length. Okay, if you're looking through it, you will notice that your plane of focus is changing. So maybe if you're looking through it and you are Kind of twisting that lens forward and backwards you might see the lamp is in focus now the bed is in focus etc etc you probably intuitively already know that just from the experience you have with your camera already but now you know why that is happening the principle is similar to a magnifying glass most of us have used a magnifying glass we move it forward or back until the image is sharp same thing with the camera okay so it's a, it takes a, a pretty good eye to really be thoughtful about what is in focus through your lens, through your viewfinder. Some lenses have a focal range. What is yours? Okay, so go ahead and the look on your lens. So on mine that I have right here, it's 18 to 55 millimeter. That's pretty standard. You can get a whole range of lenses with different focal distances. Some cameras, oh, some lenses and cameras have a fixed focal length. That means that the original, that the optimal distance from the photographer to the subject will be more limited. Okay, so often, um, I think the most common one is actually uh, 50 millimeters. You could have a static lens that actually can't adapt. That means you as a person need to step forward or back. I have also talked to some students who are working with different types of cameras, like a point and shoot camera. Um, often hmm, things like cell phones can also have a pretty limited focal range. They adjust focus just a little bit differently. I'm gonna very quickly fix this light situation. All right, better. Sorry about that. Okay, so cell phones also have limited focal range. Through technology, they kind of get around that. But not all lenses are actually adaptable. Sometimes they have a fixed focal length or a fixed lens. We just call that usually a fixed lens. Um, that means it doesn't have a focal range. It just has one optimal distance. So you, as a photographer, need to move forward or backward or have your subject move in time. That's a great learning tool. It is very limiting. It does make things a little bit more difficult. You have to be more thoughtful. Um, often it takes a little more time, but it's a great learning tool to discover how to take great photos when you limit yourself in that way. So do know that not everyone has a focal range. A very standard one that probably most people have is the 18 to 55 macro lenses, telephoto lenses, you don't have to memorize all these different types of lenses, but all of those just have a different focal range. That's why uh, professional photographers will often have a, a whole backpack full of lenses because they are each great for different scenarios. And there's no lens that is perfect for every scenario. That is because of the focal range. Okay. In the cases of point and shoot cameras and phones, this means that focus is relying not on focal length, but on depth of field. Okay, so that was the caveat. So I said that cell phones actually produce focus in a different way. So if you have your camera on your phone, you can actually, you can usually click different parts of your screen and it will focus those. That is actually done not via focal length, 
So there, there is nothing physical happening. Everything is in focus, but when you click an area on your cell phone, it actually uses what we call depth of field, which is blurring everything else and just having our subject in focus. And it actually does that through uh, software and electronic means, not through the actual physics of the light coming through the lens. Okay, uh, we also call this bokeh. That's what it's called in, in cell, cell phone photography. Okay, so depth of field. We've seen these photos, but now you know the names. Okay, so when everything is in focus, we say this has a deep or a lot of depth of field. That means many things are in focus. How that happens is by adjusting our aperture. So the aperture corresponds to the sensation of depth and field, how much fuzziness or clarity you have in your camera versus this one right here. So this is taken with the same camera, same time of day, but a different aperture. So now we have a shallow depth of field. So that means our focal plane is very shallow or small. So within this focal plane, we have a our sliding window here that is just in the area of the flower, everything else is blurry. Okay, so deep depth of field, shallow depth of field. Wholly manipulated by the aperture. So you can see this, if our aperture is as wide as possible, so remember that the aperture numbers are backwards from intuitive, the, the smaller the number, the wider that circle is. So the wider we have that open, the more shallow depth of field we have. The smaller the aperture, the wider, the deeper that depth of field. Okay, three things control how great the depth of field will be in a photograph, the focal lens, the aperture, and the distance from the subject. Okay, so this, this next step is going to make you intentionally very aware of how close or far you are from your subject and, and manipulating that focus very intentionally. All right, I'm going to have you watch this video right here. So I'll go ahead and post that uh, on our discussion board for the week. But after you watch this video, I will have you then go to actually better place for that. I'll put it in the in the notes of this YouTube video. So in the notes of this YouTube video, I will have you go watch this. This is from a very uh, famous purveyor of cameras. Uh, all of the professional photographers are aware of this company. They did produce this video. I think the, the knowledge provided here is very, very helpful. And I also think it's helpful uh, to describe these more kind of complex physics terms in a few different ways. So maybe if it didn't click when I said it, it will click in the second video. So please go ahead and watch that. It will also give you more tips on the actual manipulation of the camera and how to make these happen. After you watch that video, the exercise for this week is to turn in, similarly to that bracket exercise, one example of this. So I would like you to go out and photograph one subject with a deep depth of field and one with a shallow depth of field. So similar to your bracketing, it should be the same scene. Everything should stay identical, but just through your camera settings, I'd like you to produce one image with a deep depth of field, and one with a shallow. You will turn in both of those images to me. And that is your exercise for the week. That will let me know that you are understanding how to manipulate this depth of field. The range, that you have will be dependent on your camera and the lighting situation. So I don't expect everyone's to be identical, but I want the goal to make it as extreme as possible. So really try to push the boundaries of that depth of field.